Hi everybody, in this video we're going to talk about clustering standard errors. What are standard errors? So the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so if you think about that, like what is the standard deviation and what is the square root of the sample size? So standard deviation is generally how dispersed the data is around the mean, right? So if it's really clustered close to the mean and it's really centered on the mean, then it's going to have a low standard deviation. If it's, it's all spread out, if the distribution is all spread out and relatively far away from the mean, it's going to have a high standard deviation, right? And so if you have like uh, a lot of data points that are all clustered really closely around the mean, then that's going to have a high, or sorry, that will have a, a low standard error, right? Because the standard deviation will be very small, that it's all around the mean. And the denominator, the square root of n, so the square root of the number of observations, is going to be large. So the standard deviation will be very small. The denominator will be very large. Overall, the standard error will be small. And so the way you can think about it is like the error bars, right? So if you picture the mean on a, on a um, chart, like a bar graph, right? And so you're like, okay, the mean, let's say the mean height in our class is 510. Okay, and then we have one student who's 5'11", one student who's 5'9", and everyone else is exactly 5'10". Then um, you can, if we had a bar chart, you would say, all right, well, the average height is 5'10", right? And then so the standard errors effectively are the error bars, which means, again, how distributed is the data around the mean? And in this case, the error bars are going to be super small, right? Or super tight. So... Above it, it might be like, you know, one inch or less than one inch in this case. And below it, it'll be less than one inch. So it'll be very, the error bars will be concentrated right around that mean of 510. However, in the contrary, let's say if it's super distributed uh, and, you know, we have students who are 5'1", students who are 5 feet, and we have some students who are like 6'8", and not much around the area of 5'10", then the standard deviation is going to be large, right? Because on average, they'll still be around 5'10". We've got, let's say, the girls are 5 feet, the boys are 6'8". In general, the mean is still 5'10", but the standard deviation is very large. And so the standard error will then be large, and then so we'll still have this mean of 5'10", but the error bars are going to be much higher. They're not going to be tight around the mean. The error bars are going to be much, much higher. Um and much lower, so much wider error bars. Okay, and in general, the standard error is telling you how clustered the observation and the distribution are around the mean or how far away the observations and the distribution are from the mean. That's what standard error tells you. Okay, so why would we want to cluster the standard errors? Well, three reasons. There may be a concern that our error terms and panel data are correlated with each other over time, across space, or within a group. So can we think about what that means? Why would panel data be correlated over time? This kind of serial correlation can bias our estimators of the standard errors of the betas if we don't adjust for it. Clustering standard errors allows us to adjust for it. All right. So we're going to think about this in the next. So here's some example of panel data. Right. We're looking at Coca-Cola's returns and Pepsi's returns. Right. So first of all, why is it the case that this could be the standard errors could be serially correlated with each other over time or within a group. So let's start within a group. So we have Coca-Cola is one group, Pepsi's the, the next group. Why would Coca-Cola standard errors be correlated or sorry, why would the error terms of Coca-Cola's returns be correlated with each other and Pepsi's would also be correlated with each other, but in a different way. Let's look at it. So here's an example of a regression that produces expected stock returns. This is, this is basically the cap M if, if XT is the market, right? This is the expected return of an asset when you correlate that asset against the market, okay? Well, the error terms may be serially correlated by company. For example, there may be an omitted variable that helps explain Coca-Cola's returns, and that omitted variable is contained in the error term. So let's say Coca-Cola has a really good CEO, and that CEO has been at Coca-Cola for a long time. She's doing an amazing job, okay? That is going to, that, so the return, she's going to help drive the stock returns higher, right? And that's not going to be explained by the correlation with the market, 
Okay. Right. Because maybe sometimes she's doing well, sometimes she's doing less well, et cetera. So it's really, it's the CEO that's driving the results. So that's not going to be explained by this correlation with the market. And yet, so that will be factored into the error term. And now let's say Pepsi has a really lousy CEO and right. has has a string of lousy CEOs. Um, and then maybe a, a one or two good ones. So then in that case, again, the returns of Pepsi are going to be driven by Pepsi CEOs, which is not going to be captured in this market term, but is going to be driven in this error term, right? And so um, so then there basically are omitted variables that help explain Pepsi's returns. There's an omitted variable that helps explain Coca-Cola's returns, right? And so in short, we could see that the error terms in Coca-Cola are going to be correlated. The error terms in Pepsi are going to be correlated but they're really not so much, the error terms are not so much correlated across groups, right? It's not Pepsi's error terms are correlated with Coke's. It's Pepsi's cor- error terms are correlated with each other. And Coca-Cola's error terms are correlated with each other. And so this is where we, this is the exact case where we'd want to cluster the standard errors by firm, right? At the firm level. So Coca-Cola's standard errors are clustered. Pepsi's are, uh, are clustered, et cetera. Now, we could also correlate across time, right? We've talked previously about how, you know, Pepsi and Coke, you know, there are specific time periods where um, they may be, you know, things may be going on in those time periods that can cause zero correlation um, in the error terms just across those time periods. And you can easily imagine that, right? Like legislation from a government. If in a specific time period, the government is you know, behaving in a certain way, that's affecting the, the firms, you could easily get zero correlation across time. And so just as we can cluster our standard errors by time we, or by firm, we can also cluster them by year or by month or however we want to do it. And so that so how do we address this? Cluster the standard errors. This allows our errors to be arbitrarily correlated within groups, for example, by firm, by time, without biasing our standard errors. For example, we could cluster our standard errors by firm, we could cluster, cluster them by time, et cetera. And then, so how, what's the code to do this in Python? It's this, you know, you create a model where here's the model, and then you put in this, you know, covariance type is cluster, covariance keywords is groups, and then the, the group is GBK, if your firm identifier is GBK. Or if, you know, you wanna do it by time, then you would do put like year in here or month, however, whichever time unit you wanted to exploit. But anyway, that's how you create sta- cluster your standard errors in Python. Okay, pop quiz. Which of the four OLS assumptions does cluster standard errors help address? Recall the four OLS assumptions are linearity, homoscedasticity, independence, and normality. So the answer is. So is it linearity? No, because clustering standard errors is mainly about when you have related observations and related error terms, right? So it may help address, so it's not gonna be linearity. Normality, not not really, not principally, right? Not directly. Um, it's It looks like it's gonna be more homoscedasticity because the variance of the residual is the same. So if the, or it could be independence, right? So let's look. So the, the answer is independence, but right, because you're fundamentally what's going on here is the observations are not independent from each other and the error germs are not independent more specifically. And so in this case, it'll be independence, but then, uh, you know, I think it's, it will also be related to homoscedasticity. So independence would be the best answer. Homoscedasticity would be a, a, a reasonable answer as well. All right. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it's helpful in, um, you know, reading the research and you, as you're starting to think about doing your own research as well. Thanks so much. See you next time.